So I sent you a text. Yeah. It's not a long text, but if you have it to, to get it up, that would be good. If not, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll share it with you. So here we are today. Today is what? Today is what day? Today is the 10th day of Sivan. We're still very much connected to Shavuos because for seven days after Shavuos, Jews were still bringing the holiday korbanas, the, 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 the offerings in the Beis HaMikdash. So hence for seven days after Shavuos, including Shavuos, we don't say Tachman, it's still Yom Tavdik, because the obligatory, a Jew had to bring two korbanas every Yom Tav, when he came to Yerushalayim to the Beis HaMikdash. One that was completely consumed on the Mizbeach called a Korb, uh, uh, Eula, a Korban Eula, that's in connection with the fact that he's seeing Hashem and Hashem is seeing him. And you have to bring a festive offering, partly consumed on the Mizbeach, partly consumed by the Koenim and, and the, part of the meat he ate with his family, which is why on, on Yom Tov it's a mitzvah eat meat. Okay, so we're still in that period. So it's still very much part of Shavuos. So friends, we're looking at the opening words of the Ten Commandments. Let me just get up what I sent you yesterday. Uh, here it is. Okay. Uh, how, okay, how do you, how do you, I forgot how you lock the screen. There's a way to do that. What do you do? Drag down from the top, you'll have oh, the drag circle down from the top. Uh, from the top? You know, then I don't see, uh, what? Drag down from the top right. Oh, top right. Oh, yeah. That's it. Got done. Okay, so now I can turn it over. My eight-year-old taught me. Yeah, can you imagine now this is what you're talking to? Okay, so what we're looking at is as follows. The opening words of the, of the Sedes Hadib is the Ten Commandments. Hashem says, as we all know, the immortal words, I am God, your Lord. I shall took you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no more. Uh, you shall have no uh, other gods before me. The prohibition of idolatry. So Rashi, let's bear in mind that Rashi is the most basic commentary possible, the most straightforward, the most obvious, simple solutions to any questions a person would have. So Rashi asks, Why is Hashem employing the singular, I am your God, as opposed to your in the plural? In English, there's no difference, but in French, for example, there is isn't something in Hebrew, tu and vu, right? So here, it doesn't say, Adi Hashem, Malikeichem. Hashem is speaking to the multitudes of Eden. All Jews ever to be born for that matter. So you should have used it when you address the plural, second person plural. No, it's like he's, it's a singular, like he's talking to one person. So friends, if I would ask you that question, and like many commentaries offer the answer, what would you say? Why is Hashem using the singular? Because he wants to convey, what would you say? That he's talking to each one of us individually. The Ten Commandments are not addressed simply to the collective cloud Yisrael, but every year, right? That's what you would say. That's a simple answer. Yet Rashi doesn't give that answer. Rashi's answer is astounding. I think we may have spoken about this, but I'm gonna, did we? Let's see. Did we speak about this before? I'm not sure. Okay, I don't, I'm not sure myself. We'll see further. So look at Rashi's answer. Why Hashem uses the singular? Astounding answer. Lita in Pischem Pele Moshe to give Moshe Rabbeinu an opening to argue Sanigurya defense the Maisa Egel when Jews will subsequently serve the golden calf 40 days after the Torah was given. How will it? What kind of defense? The defense is going to be which Moshe actually used. Because what happened later, we read, Moshe said to Hashem, when Hashem told him, he's up on the mountain, your people are worshipping the golden calf and I will destroy them. The ultimate betrayal just after the giving of the Torah. And what's Moshe's response? In Pashas Kisisa, these are the words Moshe says, Why should God be angry with, his, with your people? Why should God be angry? Could there be a greater betrayal than this? So what's he arguing? Moshe says, You didn't tell them they should have no other 
they shouldn't worship other gods. And he spoke to me alone. What are you angry at them for? So this is the answer why Hashem uses the singular so Moshe can exploit that and say, you were talking to me, not to them, and defend the Jews. So before we go any further, because by the way, we're thinking, but this isn't true. It's a nice argument that a lawyer might use, you know, in a technicality in a court of law. But this is the truth. Is Hashem talking to everybody or not? Of course he is. So what kind of argument is this? What kind of defense? But before we get to that, on a simple level, how much Hashem loves us? Consider what's going on over here. Hashem is revealing himself at Har Sinai. This is the first time in history. And mind you, never to be duplicated. There's a famous teaching of the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Rebbe of Chabad, who said, Mat and will not happen again. In other words, even when Mashiach will come, tremendous revelations, God will be revealed, nothing will duplicate, replicate what happened at Har Sinai. This was the most awesome eternal revelation. And Hashem is talking and introduces himself. Hashem reveals himself. The whole world is in stunned silence. I am God, your Lord. In those very words, Hashem is already saying in such a way because the Yidna are going to do the worst sin in the world really soon. And as I'm talking about myself in my opening words of the Aseret which is the essence of the entire Torah, Hashem is framing his words in such a way that Moshe can use as a defense to... to to, to, to uh, defend them and to mitigate the punishment. In fact, Hashem wants to destroy the Yidin. That's completely uh, neutralized and defend the Jews. Friends, you see what I'm saying here? First of all, Hashem is saying, I know you're going to sin. It's part of the plan. There'll be teshuva, you'll do teshuva. But he's already compromising, as it were, the way he would in, in theory, convey the Ten Commandments in order to give Moshe defense for the Eden. He couldn't give the defense some other way later, after the whole Matan Torah, right there at Sinai, right there where the Torah is given. How Yid is everything to Hashem, and our failings, even the deepest failings, the deepest transgression, this is betrayal, this is idolatry, it's spiritual adultery. Here, Hashem is giving Moshe a way out to defend the Yid and, and, the, and to set in motion the process of Teshuvah. So that's like an observation that's right there in the verse, which is, I, I hope you agree, so encouraging and so expressive of Hashem's essential, absolute, unconditional love for each one of us. But we're still left with our question. Our question is, it's a nice defense, and Moshe uses it, and we're very thankful and grateful. But it's not true. Hashem is talking to everyone. So what does it mean? What does it mean Hashem is only talking to Moshe Rabbein? Question's clear. I'm now going to begin the answer. The answer is as follows. Let's, I'll go kind of fast forward, and we'll come back and fill in the blanks. Who is Moshe Rabbeinu? The leader. What is a leader? A leader is an Ashamba soul who embraces all the people. Or to rephrase those words, all the people are like an extension of his great soul. Or in the words of the Rambam, Maimonides, who describes a Jewish king, he says that the king is the, the, the Melech, is the heart of the people. Actually, the word Melech, king, stands for Moyach, Lev, Kovid, brain, heart, liver. These are the three critical organs of the body that serve to animate and give life to the entire body. That's what a king is. A king is, a true leader is not an individual, one other person. He lies at the heart, his whole identity is the people, he lives for the people, breathes the people. It's his whole life, and his whole life is to bring them life, to inspire, to connect, etc., Like the physical body, these primary organs. What I'm saying is this, friends, I'm going to explain. Had the Jewish people heard, and it wasn't meant to be, but had they heard the Ten Commandments, 
with the depth of their own soul. The Moshe Rabbeinu within them, then the golden calf wouldn't have happened. And as I'll explain, the solution, therefore, to the golden calf lies in this here as well, in the Moses within. Let me explain what I mean. The whole story of the golden calf, Egel Azov, is very hard to understand. How does a people turn around after 40 days of witnessing Hashem at Mount Sinai, as we said earlier, unparalleled in history? And let's remember the experience of the crossing of the Red Sea and the 10 plagues, and then go worship a golden calf. How is this possible? So the Ramban explains, Nachmanides, that there were many levels to what was going on at the people at the time. It wasn't just one uniform uh, 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 behavior. Because the people comprised all kinds of elements, including the Edevrav, the mixed multitude that went out out of Egypt, they were, they, were, they were from all kinds of nationalities. They just wanted to join the, the winning team and be part of the Jewish people. So they quickly fell back to their idolatry. But the fact is, everybody was part of it on some level. So what does it mean? So this is the gist of explanation. It's an incredible insight. The people said like this. Moshe Rabbeinu said, the Torah tells us, I'm coming back in 40 days. According to their calculation, the 40th day of coming didn't come back. Now, their mistake was he meant 40 complete days, including the night before, as we counted in the Jewish calendar. And they counted the day he went up, which wasn't part of it. So he came back the next day. The whole thing was one day off. At any rate, so this is what they said. Moshe didn't come back. Why didn't he come back? You know why he didn't come back? Because he went on a one-way trip in heaven. Like what happened later to the sons of Aaron, not of an avil. What was their sin? When, if you know the story, without repeating the story now, the day the Mishkan was inaugurated, they brought this offering, they weren't commanded to, and mysteriously their souls expired. It explains the Rechaim and other commentaries, in this longing and blaze of glory, their souls spilled out over their body, out of their body, and attached to Hashem. Kleisa Nefesh. That's what happened to Moshe Rabbeinu. We don't blame him. He was up on our Sinai, talking to Why should he come back and deal with us? come back to deal with, with the riffraff and our problems. So he went and he didn't come back. But we need a leader. So you know what? We need a leader, listen to these words, that will not be subject to this mistake, this human, not mis they call it a mistake, this human condition. And what's that? An angel. An angel is like a robot. Angel gives instructions. It does. It's a spiritual robot. The golden calf friends. Where did it come from? Where did the idea come from? Because the Torah was given, the heavens opened up, and they saw what we read in the Aftarah of Shavuos. If you're following along, the Aftarah of Shavuos is this elaborate description. The prophet Yechezkel describes the heavenly chariot and the heavenly angels, and he uses the imagery of the face of an ox and an eagle and a lion and a person. There's a whole description there. It's all symbolic. Angels are called animals, or I said robot, really an animal. An animal is a brute force that has no choice, has no free will. Angels are godly brute forces. Chesed, Gevura, whatever their, their makeup is, but they don't have intelligence in the sense to choose to behave otherwise. So we need a kind of leadership down here that will convey to us what Hashem wants without their own human element getting in the way, like Moshe Rabbeinu, he was up there to come down, but he forgot about us and just went one way. That's what they were saying. That's the kind of leader we want. He wanted an angel. And the physical eagle was, an was a physical representation of the angel they saw on high, the strongest brute force, the, the ox. Now, by the way, what happened after Hashem gave the Torah? One of the we have to make a Mishkan, a sanctuary for him. And inside the Mishkan is what? Is the, is the Holy Ark, the House of the Ten Commandments. On top of it is a golden slab, out of which comes two forms, the Chruvim. And according to the Ramban, they were angelic forms. Angels. And Hashem speaks between there. No. So, hello. This is pretty much what's going to be commanded anyway later. 
again, for other people that were just the lower levels of society of the Jewish people then, it was just when they went nuts, they went back to the old way. But we're talking that they had it all begin and everybody was part of it in some way or another, except for the tribe of Levi and the women, mind you. Everybody else was. How could it be? You're hearing. So now the question is, where are they wrong? What's wrong with this? All they're saying is, Moshe, they want an infallible. Moshe is fallible. He's human. And he forgot about us. And he went out in the blaze of glory. He remained Lamaila. And, and they forgive him. Beautiful. It's good for you, Moshe. We, you deserve it. Be one with Hashem forever. But we need down here. So that's where they're wrong. So friends, they're wrong because a leader cannot be an angel for many reasons. Number one, you, to be a leader, you have to understand the people. You have to feel what they're feeling. Matter, an angel doesn't. An angel is just this, again, it's just this divine animal, spiritual animal or robotic animal that can't lead. To lead, you have to have empathy. You have to feel the people. So that's why they're wrong. Number one. And I think we may have spoken about this. That's, this is a very important lesson in, as a parent, as a leader, in a business, if you want to really inspire, that you, got to, you really have to feel what the, your worker or your student or your child is going through, and then you offer your advice and direction. It's a whole different advice. First of all, it's a better advice because you really feel what they're going through. But it's also psychologically, if the recipient feels your empathy, they'll respond to you better rather than this is the way it is and follow the rules. You have to make a bond. Just by the way, yesterday I, I, I just heard for the first time, or someone, someone told me, I was wondering why we say a shakoyach to the koyan, Ari, you're a koyan. Why do we say shakoyach to the, to the koyan after he gives a bracha? Benji. So the, the previous Rebbe said, that's the bond. The bond that we are creating between ourselves and the Koyan to internalize and receive the blessing. We're thanking him. And the Koyan responds with connecting to us. And he says, back Yishakoyach, whatever he says, Baruch It's not just a blessing and recipient. It's a meeting of people. It's a bond and empathy. It's a personal connection. You look, well, he's benching. We don't even see him. Uh, his eyes are closed. Our eyes are closed. So the, the blessing is kind of in the air. But in that moment of Yishakoyach, thank you, look in the eye. But, uh, that's when the blessings really connect and have their effect. It's a similar kind of idea. I guess so this yesterday. From a Koyan. A friend of mine in Australia. Hey, what's that? Back and forth. It's interesting. It's, it's, it's a custom. It's a custom. It, there's no way mentioned in the Gemara, the Talmud, anywhere, but I don't know how many hundreds of years it is, but it's hundreds of years, not more. Maybe it was always, but no one ever wrote it down. Anyway. So that's one reason why they're wrong. Angels can't be leaders. Number two, deeper. Deeper reason. Jews don't have intermediaries. Between us and Hashem. It's a direct connection. An angel is an intermediary. So I mean, you're saying there's Hashem, there's us, and there's an angel. No good. We have direct connection. Moshe Rabbeinu or any Jewish leader is not an intermediary because as we said before, we're all one great soul. It's, it's part of, it's a depth of who I am. And every Jew is a spark of Moshe Rabbeinu. That's what it says in the Zaya. And every Jew is the spark of the Moshe of that generation. The model, it continues in various models. And every Jew is a spark of Mashiach, who is the greatest leader. Every Jew at the core. Why? Because at the core, we're all one. It's all cloudy soul is really one great soul. Like one body, one spiritual body. So Moshe Rabbeinu is a leader because he's not in between me and God. Moshe Rabbeinu, he is at the, lies at the core of my own identity, the, the Moshe within. So having had now we have this insight, friends. We can understand a little bit. But when Hashem uses the singular, and Moshe Beno is using it as a defense, etc., it sounds like it's like, you know, it's not true. He's talking to everyone. The answer is yes. 
the singular, because Hashem is talking to the Moshe within each one of us. And had the Jews, and it wasn't meant to be, because it's a process, it's a learning curve, it takes time over the millennia. But had the Yidin then heard the Ten Commandments with the depth of their soul, the Moses within them, they would have appreciated you can't replace that with an angel. And they would have had, on a simple level, the faith, Moshe said it's coming back in 40 days. According to our, our calculation, 40 days are up. Questions on us. He'll come back. We'll have that trust. And they would have held, held out. So on all of these levels, all of these levels, it's when Hashem uses the singular, which technically means I'm talking to you, Moshe, really means I'm talking. And this is the bond. This is the whole purpose of Torah mitzvahs is that a Jew should reveal the deepest levels of his soul, his Moses within, the Mashiach within, which means, amongst other things, each one of us ourselves as a leader, each one of us has, can change and must change the world and has an indispensable role in fixing the whole world, each one of us. We're all the leader. We're all that leader. And had they heard it with that sense of responsibility, that sense of connection to the Moshe Rabbeinu within, there wouldn't be a golden calf and etc. But it wasn't meant to be because, again, it's all part of Hashem's plan. Things have to get worse before they get better. And we, we, we descend. But at least now we have the deeper understanding as, as when Hashem says, I'm talking to you. And this is the answer to idolatry. To the golden calf. The answer is that no, no angel, no intermediary, our deepest connection happens when we're bound up in the deepest way with, with, with Moshe Rabbeinu, which means we're unlocking that level within us, which means we become empowered. We realize that we're all leaders. We all have an indispensable role to play. That's, we're all Shluchim of Hashem. We're all Moshe Rabbeinu. And that's the ultimate mission of Yid. Not just he himself should be where he should be. So he's turned into mitzvahs and he obligated, he does his own obligations. If a person lives on that level, it's about his own reward and his own piety, he hasn't touched the depth of his soul. Because lying at the depth of your neshama is Moshe Rabbeinu. You are a leader. You are responsible. Hashem's talking to you. Like the whole Torah is given to you. Who And each one of us is this you. So living with a sense of responsibility. At the same time, knowing we have the koyach, then we're, we're really touching the Moses within that's the deepest connection to Hashem, and that's the answer to idolatry and all sins, which will continue next week, Beis Hashem. A big, big teaching in Hasidus in Tanya that every sin is idolatry. Every sin is idolatry. I'm not denying God. I'm just having a good time. We're going to see, no, a very, very important teaching that if we understand it properly, all struggles we face, and this, this very struggle of idolatry or Hashem's unity, or rephrase that, living deeply, the moisture within, or living externally. It all is connected to, it's all saying the same thing in different words. So we'll just begin our discussion now in the final minutes that we have. Namely, why am I saying that every sin is idolatry? It's not so, I'm not saying there's no God when I just, you know, I'm just saying time out. There's a neighbor, but, uh, but I want to do what I want to do, and I'll get back to you later. Or even more extreme example. The Gemara says like this, and, 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 people, and this, this is fact. A thief, Gemara in Brochus, A thief, he's about, he's on the threshold of the house about to steal. Rachman Akari calls out to the Abish to help me to be successful in my theft. And if we interview this thief, we say to him, wait a second, one second, before you go, let me ask you a question. You believe in God. You're praying to Him. So how are you stealing? You, you, you know that 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 theft is 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 is, is a sin. So the simple answer is, he's not connected to his own faith. Somehow we do this. We we can ask for success in something which is contrary to His will. But still, how do we do that? You know why we do it? Listen to this, because I believe that's why I steal. And you still give me what? Yeah, because the Jew says Hashem is so great and He is forgiving. No, He'll He'll uh, He'll grant me this. Does it, 
First of all, he says, does it make such a, does it make such a difference? Hashem is great. And what, my little theft, what's going to change anything? And besides, he'll forgive me. So actually use my faith as a motivation to sin. But I'm not denying that there's a God in this whole little, you know, intellectual gymnastics I just did in my head based on my faith. Because I believe in the Abish, no, there's good for Allah. He understands me, he'll forgive me. It's like, but why am I, why am I saying, the Gemara says, that every sin is really of a desire. And that's why, by the way, we only heard the Ten Commandments. We only heard the first two. We heard, I am Hashem, your Lord, to get out of Israel. And then we heard, you have no other gods. The rest, the Jews said, we can't hear anymore. Moshe, you tell us. So the al and Tanya, uh, you, know, you heard the first two, this 611 to come. The answer is these first two cover everything. I am Hashem. That's the foundation of all positive commandments. You shall have not serve idols. That's the essence of all the prohibitions. But our question to be explained next week is, what's the connection? Every sin is idolatry. I'm not denying Hashem. So what we're going to learn, God willing, in our further discussion is what does it mean Hashem is one? And now really, if we understand this, we'll appreciate what, what idolatry really means. It doesn't just mean bowing down to a yoshke, but what idolatry means, and therefore the inspiration not to do even any, any transgression. All right, friends, so what's the summary? Of, that's next week. The summary of our, our discussion today is, the bottom line is, there's the depth of our soul it's all the same. At the depth of our soul is the Moses within, which means that, that we are the leader. We are the one that needs to change and affect and inspire and influence our environment. And we all have, because of the Moses within, that's, that, that's the pin to the yid, this direct connection to Hashem, bound up with him. No intermediaries, no angels, thank you very much. Nothing in between. It's the deepest connection. And it's our task to nurture that and express that and live godly, meaningful, impactful lives. Have a wonderful day, wonderful Shabbos.